Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Tonight we have on the show Mr. Don Wirtshafter, a longtime friend and associate of mine. I've known him about 35 years. He uh, used to sell a variety of hemp products and today is opening a new cannabis museum in Ohio. So I'll have a great conversation with Don Wirtshafter after a very short interlude with first uh, the Dancing Cannabis Leaves. And then we'll be back with our hip news segment. Just a couple stories tonight. So stay tuned as we bring on the infamous Dancing Cannabis Leaves. I feel the force. story tonight is from Minneapolis, Minnesota, residents of states where cannabis is legal do not possess elevated rates of psychosis, and they're also less likely to exhibit symptoms of alcohol abuse, according to data published in the journal Psychological Medicine. A team of researchers affiliated with the University of Minnesota and the University of Colorado assessed the relationship between adult use cannabis legalization and psychosocial functioning in a cohort of 240 pairs of identical twins. One twin resided in a jurisdiction where adult use cannabis sales were legally permitted, while the other lived in a state where marijuana was criminally prohibited. Investigators reported that legalization was associated with a slight uptick in the frequency with which subjects reported consuming cannabis, a finding consistent with prior studies. However, they also reported that those in legalization states were less likely to engage in behaviors associated with problematic alcohol use. That finding is consistent with prior data indicating that the use of cannabis is associated with a decrease in the amount of alcohol consumed by individuals seeking alcohol treatment. The authors further reported that legalization was not positively correlated with increased incidences of psychosis, substance abuse disorders, or other adverse outcomes. The authors concluded, quote, recreational cannabis legalization causes increases in mean cannabis frequency and residents of recreational states had fewer recent symptoms of adult use disorder. Broadly speaking, our co-twin control and differential vulnerability results suggest that the impacts of recreational cannabis legalization on psychiatric and psychosocial outcomes are otherwise minimal. Both sets of results are reassuring with respect to public health concerns around recreational cannabis legalization, end quote. Although the use of cannabis and other controlled substances tends to be more common among those with psychotic illness, studies indicate that lifetime incidences of marijuana-induced psychosis are relatively rare among those who do not already have a prior diagnosis of a psychiatric disease. According to one recently published study, fewer than one half of 1% of cannabis consumers had ever reported experiencing psychotic symptoms requiring medical intervention a percentage that's lower than the rate associated with alcohol. The full text of this study, recreational cannabis legalization has had limited effects on a wide range of adult psychiatric and psychosocial outcomes, appears in this month's edition of Psychological Medicine. Our last story tonight is out of Canada. Canadian patients authorized to use medical cannabis products report sustained improvements in their health-related quality of life. A team of investigators affiliated with McGill University in Montreal assessed the safety and efficacy of medical cannabis products in a cohort of 2,991 patients. Subjects in the study consumed cannabis flour, extracts, or other related products for one year. Consistent with other studies, the researchers reported, quote, all patient-reported outcomes showed a statistically significant improvement at three months, which was maintained or further improved for pain, interference, tiredness, and well-being over the remainder of the 12-month follow-up. Results also revealed clinically significant improvements in pain, interference, and tiredness, anxiety, and well-being from the baseline, end quote. Few patients reported experiencing any serious adverse events as a result of their cannabis intake. The authors concluded, quote, medical cannabis directed by physicians appears to be safe and effective within three months of initiation for a variety of medical indications, end quote. The data published late last week in the journal, Journal of American Medical Association Network Open reported that nearly one in four pain patients residing in states where medical cannabis access is legally self-identified as marijuana consumers. Well, that's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. If you are a loved one or looking for a doctor to help you get a medical marijuana permit, well, that's what we can help you with. You can call our office at 503-235-4606. It's 503-235-4606. Uh, now our interview and guest is Don Wirtshafter, a 
a lawyer in Ohio, a longtime activist, and it's a great pleasure to finally get him on the show. Uh, tune in. and I would like to introduce uh, Don Wirtschafter, who I've known and, and done business with for over 30 years. He's turned me down a few hundred times to come on the show, but I'm glad you finally decided to come on. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Paul. I'm not sure why this time worked. I must be bored. <laughs> well, you, you've you been a longtime hemp activist. We initially met so, uh, when I was selling hip paper back in the early 90s, I believe. I remember uh, before my first load came in, I remember our conversation. But uh, how did you first come to discover hemp and decide to, you founded back then the Ohio Hempery, which was one of the nation's premier mail order catalogs for hemp products. How did you come to hemp? I was a small town lawyer. I was a, you know, a hippie back to the lander who lived in rural Appalachia. And all of a sudden my neighborhood got threatened with a big strip mine and it radicalized me. I spent a year fighting that strip mine. We won the Ohio Environmental Achievement Award for our work. Well, here we this is 19, October 77 was the big uh, hearing in that mine. Okay. And uh, it's kind of my transformation. And I kept studying the law and fighting different environmental nightmares that we're constantly faced with here. Um, kept realizing I needed a lawyer. I need a lawyer. I need a lawyer. So I ended up going to law school in 1982 through 85. I studied computers and had my first child, got married, all these things in the middle of law school. But I did well and got out of there in two years, two and a half years, and off I went and opened up a law practice, and then all of a sudden we had Reagan, and then we had the minimum mandatory sentences, the judges lost their discretion to sentence people, give them probation and crimes. Uh, we had the good faith exception to the... Um, the warrant search warrant requirements so that uh, the cops could do about anything and judges were letting them. Everything changed. Being a defense lawyer in the drug war was really difficult. I felt like we needed a different strategy and I joined the hemp movement beginning about 1987-88. You know, I was always a, a small time grower and advocate from my first days of smoking is what got me back to the land living out in the country when did you start smoking 19 it was 80 67 or 68 probably into the 68 my friend drew bontheus took me up into his attic room and he put me through the ritual he, he had this uh secret spot he showed me how important it was to keep secrecy you know this is the result of 10 years in prison if they caught you with a joint kind of secrecy and how this was a brotherhood and how this was a ritual and how you had a hold of it and all these things that but you know he had this ingenious hiding spot i've, I've never been able to duplicate how old and, were you uh, huh I, I was 16 17. okay yeah, right in that time period. And, uh, um, it, you know, it, it was stayed important in my life. When I tried pot, even the first time, some people, you know, they say, oh, well, I didn't get high the first time and all that. That was a, a rumor. Maybe they didn't really have pot or whatever. But the first time I tried it, I understood, hey, what an amazing medicine for ADD. And we didn't even know the term ADD when I was in high school. Right. I was as ADD as they came to the 80s or 90s. Mm. Um, my mind is constantly on nine different things. You should see how many windows I have open on my computer and how many piles of paper sit on my desk just because they have to be finished and I'm doing it all at the same time. And uh, that's that's just me. Some people are wired that way. Uh, and I've, I found cannabis balanced me in 
it calmed me down and I've used it pretty consistently the last 55 years just about. And uh, uh, I have watched it like a hawk. I have long ago dismissed any fear of lung damage from cannabis. Uh, there wasn't any science years ago and I dismissed it then. Now we have all the science that proves that cannabis is actually good for your lungs, especially people who smoke tobacco. And it clears out the lungs, it's an expectorant. It's how the, our ancestors use it. It's one of the ways. And, and a high carcinogen. Yeah, all that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, these people understood this a long time ago. You know, they, you know and uh, it was, it really, that's the crux of what you should be interviewing me on is because, you know, what I'm doing now is the Cannabis Museum in Athens, Ohio. And, you know, from my earliest career in cannabis, I got to travel all over the world to all these places for the first time that Westerners got there. And I was always looking in the antique stores and in the factories for old hemp objects that I could buy. And I filled up trunks of this stuff and, um, you know, continuously brought it home over a period of 30 years. And so the last few years, we've been creating a cannabis museum. We're at CannabisMuseum.com. And my principal collection is the documentation of the history of cannabis as a medicine. That the cannabis had a golden age, a golden era, a uh, hundred years ago where it was one of the best and most popular medicines on the market. And then something happened. And what I'm documenting over, over time is that what happened is they brought in the European cannabis first. Our real earliest of settlers brought that with them because they came on ships that needed the, you know, to have the seeds on them in case they ever got reefed and they needed to grow new sails and new, new ropes. Right, so they, you know, so the, we always had sativa in the early accounts of the people who lived in America talked about using it for arthritis and all these different remedies that they could get with the hemp. Uh, but then about 1830 to 1860, all this uh, basically hashish from Asia got brought in. And they understood this was cannabis, but they thought it to be a different species. It got named by Lamarck, who was the second most famous of the taxonomists, uh, to be cannabis indica. Cannabis sativa was named by the most famous of the um, botanists and uh, Linnaeus. And uh, the fact that he called it sativa meant that it was in common use or useful. And, uh, and then indica meant it's Asian variety. And they thought these two different varieties. But as soon as they started to try to grow them with, you know, they either on their own hybridized them or they had inevitable cross-pollination between the various plants that they brought here. And pretty soon they had a mosh of cannabis and nobody could get, and it happened overseas too. Without understanding the, the genetics, the human intervention was to just totally mix up the genetics. And what that did is took plants that had evolved in Europe to produce CBD, and both of their genes were set for CBD, as opposed to the more native plants from Asia, it comes from Asia, and those plants have the gene set for THC. So these plants from Europe are a variant that are really only varying in one gene. And as soon as you mix these things up, you have a mosh of plants in a very unstable set of genetics that give you some plants with a lot of THC and some plants with a lot of CBD and a lot of plants with a mix of the two and trying to unmix these two genies uh, that got combined in one bottle 
proved impossible because they didn't trust themselves to taste it and differentiate between the good stuff and the bad stuff. For they, the long time, they said it was poison. And they oh, yeah, they, yeah, they did. They, they were, I mean, I'm sure there were botanists that tasted it and enjoyed it and weren't scared of it. But the popular literature labeled it as poisonous. Poisonous meaning not necessarily that we kill you like we think of it today, but poisonous as a, that an overdose of it would have the potential to make you sick. If that was enough to be able to label the poison. There's a whole long history of poisons and poison medicines and, you know, how cannabis was labeled and the well, whole, it, you know, the people who have a big dose of edibles get, even if they love cannabis, they might become very nauseous. I've never had that reaction, but I've seen it among a lot. I of certainly people. have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah. But back to the, the differences of uh, the two. Mm-hmm. I just want to also say you have probably the best glass collection of antique medical marijuana containers I, in the world. Uh, and you diff- you've got all the different kinds. I know. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I wish I could go visual with you. Maybe uh, I'll tell you what. I'll try to do some cut-ins. But, I, I have some photos. You're and, welcome uh, to cut in with some of the photos. Bill will edit them in. Thank you, Bill. Okay. And, but, you know, we've got over 1,200 containers that cannabis was sold in prior to 1937. And these range from extremely old apothecaries to the turn of the century stuff, you know, around. 1900 glass went from being extremely expensive and to be a glass jar on an apothecary shelf was really a status thing because people didn't see very much in glass you know to over the years they got better and better with the making of furnaces and the purification of the sands to to get really high-end glass but they also developed machines to actually mold glass uh, it, instead of it being a hand process, they had machines that would just crank out bottles and glass went from being really expensive to being really inexpensive. And that happened about the beginning of the 1900s. And the thing about that is that, that we had a wild west era of medicines then that uh, anybody with a wagon and a box of these bottles could be in the business selling coffee water or whatever as a pharmaceutical. There was no government regulation whatsoever. And the, the real problem started when these companies started putting things like coca and heroin in the bottles and then women that were taking it would get addicted and you know, their husbands would be having to go to town to get more every day. And it became quite a phenomenon to the point where the government had to put its foot down. And so beginning in 1906 and uh, even more in 1913, the government regulated the pharmaceutical industry. And I look at it like a model of what our cannabis industry is going through now, where We've got the Wild West, and people are putting anything in a bottle and making any kind of stupid health claims on it that they want in the face of the FDA telling them not to. And there's a point pretty quickly here where the government's going to put its foot down. And so I have a lot of advocacy for the industry as it is trying to self-regulate itself and come up with standards on our own before we have standards shoved down our throat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so with your bottle collection, you have different kinds of cannabis, everything from the seeds and the pollen and of course the resin to syrups and talk about that a little bit if you would. I, I would actually, we've got one set of nine bottles that we think is complete or one bottle short of being complete. There were nine or 10 basic products being sold on the shelf. I should look at the photo of this and uh, 
read them off to you, but from my memory, you've got the cannabis sativa, the cannabis indica, then you had a cannabis Americana, which was this mosh that we're talking about. You're getting both THC and CBD in the Americana. And you're getting CBD in the, in, in the uh, sativa and, uh, sorry, and you're getting uh, THC in the indica, right? And the mosh of the two was the Americana. And so they understood this. They basically were making Sativex in the old days. Sativex is the pharmaceutical drug that contains both THC and CBD, and it's used for MS and spasticity disorders. And so then you've got uh, hemp seeds, and you had hashish, but you also had hemp tincture, which was a raw product. It was not decarboxylated. You make it just by taking the cannabis blossoms and soaking them in alcohol for a week, maybe. There was a whole procedure in the USP that was developed trying to standardize these extracts. And then you had the syrup. So the pure tincture is not decarboxylated. It's THCA. And it's something that you could feed to a child and it, the child would not have the side effect of having a psychoactive reaction. You could do it for yourself. Well, but that, no one knew about THC. THC wasn't going to be... Well, right. The, they, they didn't understand any of this chemistry at the time, but they understood what worked. That's why they called it practicing medicine. They had incredible powers of observation, and this is how they were able to uh, uh, learn all these things. It's just watching and, and being, you know, caring about their patients in a way that modern doctors have no concept of. Okay, so let's see, I'm going through it. So you have the tincture. If you cook it down in sugar for a couple of hours, you get a syrup. Basically, you've decarboxylated it. And that would have been very powerful to take a dose of. You could also take the tincture and distill it again, distill out the alcohol. And that would have been the fluid extract of cannabis. And that would have been basically what we're calling RSO, Rick Simpson oil, or, you know, basically the thick goo that you can um, do large concentrations of THC from. And let's see, that, how many do I have? Oh, then there's also the elixir, the, that the, the, the druggists would have their own formulas for creating an elixir. Basically, I'm interpreting the elixir from the formulas as being We've cooked the shit out of this to get this extract, and we realize that on its own, this stuff isn't that potent. But if we can add a few terpenes back into it, wow, then you have a real effect. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prove that that's what, what they were doing with these elixirs 100 years ago. But uh, the formula is very considerably for it. So this is the, the research that we're doing. There's actually five of us working on a full-time basis. Um, COVID started and my COVID project became buying and fixing up this large company store building here in uh, Eastern Ohio, Southeastern Ohio, just in the city of Athens, Ohio, which is you know the hippie central of, of Southeastern Ohio or of Ohio. And uh, it's a, you know, the center of our back to the land community, which is fading away as all my friends die off. But it's a, it's a very special place here. And um, so we've built this museum. We're just getting it started. We're just getting ready to open our doors. If you go look at our website, cannabismuseum.com, you'll see our old website. We're getting ready to launch a whole new website with all these new products and we're getting ready to try to publicize the availability of this museum. We're kind of, we're right on Route 15, one of the main roads across the U.S., but trying to get people to stop is quite hard. We're not sure what we're going to do for publicity other than interviews like this. Um, we, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a, it, I found it a lot, I found it really difficult to get the construction of this old building 
through all the bureaucracies of the state and all the construction work and dealing with all the craftsmen and tradesmen. So I was basically the general contractor on this job and chief carpenter. And it was really hard, but I'm finding actually opening up the museum and all the systems that it takes to be an open museum and to actually have the, the credibility of the museum and the care of the objects of the museum and the security systems of the museum and the accounting systems of the museum and the fundraising and all these different things have to kind of be in line but you'll see that i think actually tomorrow the day after we create this interview and probably a couple days before you air it there will be a membership campaign on behalf of the Cannabis Museum, and we'd love you to come and join and be members. We promise you enough content to make your membership worthwhile. We're bringing in all kinds of things. You know, when I started collecting these jars, I thought that I'd, you know, searched the world and I found like a couple dozen, and I thought I was doing really, really well. I thought, my God, I found everything. But I've got a friend who knows the market and knows the market really well, especially these controlled substance collectors. And on our behalf, he's spent almost 20 years now combing the antiques world, trying to find these jars, and he keeps finding them. It's just, it's kind of a constant flow. A guy wrote me from Germany the other day and sold me three jars. And it's, it's just, you know, I've got collectors in many different countries, you know, through working through eBay and other sources. And we're putting all these resources in one place, trying to amass that critical mass to make the world understand how mainstream cannabis was in the old days and how important it was in our society and how the knowledge of that was just totally wiped out by a purposeful program of the federal government to basically go into every drugstore on October 1st, 1937, and remove anything to do with cannabis from the drugstore, not give the druggist a receipt, you know, no compensation. They just grabbed everything cannabis. They went to every museum and library and scared the shit out of everybody to make them understand if there's anything cannabis in here, we're gonna bust people. And they just succeeded and making people grow up today that have no idea how we used to clothe ourselves or how we used to make our boats and how important this plant was as a medicine and pretty much for every aspect of our lives. It was, yeah. it was, it was wiped out of our memory and social programming. And uh, so we're kind of dedicated to bringing that back. Our first show to Paul would really interest you. We actually named it today. We're, we have an opening date, we think, of February 14th, but it may get postponed again. But our first show is called Hemp Hackles, Hemp Breaks and Hackles, How Our Ancestors Made Their Clothing. And it's, it's a fiber show. We're going back, since this is a cannabis museum, we thought we'd start with something very basic and non-controversial. Because our, like our pre-opening, we had a quick show here that was uh, psychedelic art. It was a, a, a sale of, of art. That, uh, and uh, that was just to open up and just give us give ourselves some clue of what we needed to do to actually be open. And it worked pretty well as a, a model. But then we had to close for a few months and actually put this exhibit together. And it's just a working museum. You can walk in here and you'll see people actually working on the exhibits as you're here. So the docents are the people that are got hands on. And um, uh, the. How many square feet is your building? It's 60 by 45, two and a half stories. Uh huh. You know, and, um, the downstairs is a big auditorium room that we use as a gallery, and it's got a gift shop, and it's got a, a smaller room where we can darken it and do nice exhibits. It's got a little theater, and 
we put in handicap accessible uh, uh, bathrooms and ramps and all the things that are needed, uh, parking spaces. And we've we've modernized it and got the state seal of approval to open. Uh, yeah, that's been a lot of work. You know, I should say that one of the best collectors and my best sources of glass is you, Paul, that you've been very helpful in selling us a lot of really good bottles and a lot of really good fakes. So, <laughs> well, I didn't know which ones were which primarily. Yeah, I know. Well, we're getting a lot better at telling the difference. We've got, you know, the crew that works here has got really expertise at these things. And, yeah, I think I sold you about 300 pieces or so, I think. I don't think it's that many. But. I collected from about 2007, almost exclusively through eBay. Mm -hmm. And did it primarily, you know, because I thought it was really cool. And I'd show it on this TV show. You know, every week we'd show some of the, a lot of the bottles that have appeared here on this TV show are now in your possession. Yeah, well, the problem is that you ran into these guys who had bought a trailer, two trailer loads full of old pharmacy bottles, and they were putting them out as fake cannabis bottles for several years. And then, you know, constantly on eBay, you're probably your best source. You actually, you, you bought a, a load of stuff from them and never paid for it that I was able to pick up. Uh, 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 this uh, medical treasures is what they were called. Yeah, uh, I remember that name. Yeah, remember yeah, that name. yeah. They were. They had yeah. some real stuff, but mostly they were putting out fakes. Uh -huh. They 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 must have had a lot of fun at it. Yeah, and then there was a fellow in Texas who. Uh, That's what we're talking about. Yes, it's Texas. So was it just fake about the late the the wife and the. Having them in the the attic. Of oh no, that one was real. That that's that's um. Give me a second. I'm going to come up with his name. Hill or something like that. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Robert. Yeah. I have a different name. I'll come up with it. Again. But the story behind yeah. it is that uh, his job had been to collect these things. Right, on October 1st, 1937, he and one of 1,500, you know, narcotics agents, you know, these are basically the, the guys who were enforcing prohibition, and when they prohibition ended, they were out of a job, so they created this whole bureau and gave, to give these guys something to do, and to get the troops rallied off, man, they, on October 1st, 1937, went everywhere and grabbed everything they could, and they were supposed to take it into headquarters, but this guy stuck it in his uh, closet. Man, I almost got the name. I'm, I'm, it was the name of my insurance agent 20 years ago, so I'll, I'll be able to remember it. Um, he uh, made his wife promise that she wouldn't sell the stuff for more than 10 years after his death. And yeah. like 20 years after his death, she sees an article in the Houston Chronicle about a professor at the university who collected controlled substance medicines. And she said, I've got, she recalled him up, I've got some, can you come look? And he, she sits down at her coffee table and she brings out a box and she says, my husband didn't leave me with very much and I'm really broke and I really need some $3,000 to kind of catch up on life. And I've got the closet full of this stuff like I got here in this box. And do you think you can give me $3,000 for the closet? And he looks at her and says, lady, I can get you $3,000 for this box. And in the end, it was over $300,000 they sold out of that closet. And he was an honest guy, but he was associated with the dishonest guy. No, that was... He he was a, a very uh, good student and studier and uh, quite a believer in cannabis and its history. Uh huh. His That's son perfect. donated his son donated three boxes of his books to the museum that we really treasure here. It's one of the best collections we've gotten. 
All right. So you open up your thinking on Valentine's Day, but it might get pushed back. What is your uh, admission if you're there in person? I think it's going to be five dollars or something. That's pretty you know, cheap. Yeah, it's not. It's not like we got eighteen different thousand things to show you. No, it's you know it's going to be it's it's subtle. It's more of a working space, Paul. The the museum for cannabis is got to be like 20, 25 rooms. There's so many different subjects in a cannabis museum. You've got the hemp and the whole, whole thing that we're showing off to start with, you know, how, how we made the clothing, but then you got a room or two or three of all the clothing and all the ethnic clothing from around the world that was crafted out of cannabis. And, you know, in, in modern times or in most, you know, not very, not very long ago times. All around the world, from Japan. The yeah, Indian, the Asia, yeah, Eastern Europe, and you know, there's all these instances of people, you know, Polish men getting busted in the 40s and 50s and 60s because they were growing hemp in their backyard to make their jeans. Uh huh. Right? Uh -huh. Right? Right? This, this is how they did it, and um, uh. Yeah, so I was talking about all the different facets of this thing. They, you know, then you got all the industrial things that hemp can do and, you know, all the potential of hemp. We're trying to show a little bit of that. We just pulled out things like hemp shingles today and hemp press board and all that kind of sample with all the different things that you can do with hemp. Um, then you got the medicine angle that is going to be our next show. That, you know, that's the... The one will get famous for it because nobody's got the glass collection like we've been able to accumulate. I've but, been around the world. I know you and I have been to Ben Drocker's museum in Barcelona and in the Netherlands, and he's got a collection, but it's nothing like your collection now. Well, he's got a lot. He, you remember, Ben owns those mushroom growing bunkers up there in. Northern Netherlands, he's got storage like you won't believe, you know, and he had, he spent years filling up that storage with who knows what. And no, don't, just because you see a little bit of Ben's collection in that museum, you're not seeing 1% of it. Uh -huh. here's, a, here's a fact you don't know. Do you know that Ben Dronkers was trained as a cooper? No, making barrels? Making barrels. Okay. That was, no, that, that was how he was brought up. He's got an extremely complete collection, several different Cooper shops in his in his collection. That was what he collected before him. I, <laughs> I, I didn't know that. And, and um, so... Uh, no, he's got a massive collection, and we we keep talking about cooperating and, and putting on a show together, because between his collection and mine, we basically have the, the history documented. Ben spent over $300,000 in that auction of stuff that we're talking about in Texas. Oh. Uh, you know, he got a lot of it, but he got a lot of duplicates. One of yeah. the cool things is that Ben didn't want to empty Ben wanted to empty the jars to bring him into the Netherlands. He didn't care about the contents. Oh. But the professor at the university that was handling this thought that was a waste of good antiques. Yeah. And so he wouldn't ship the stuff with contents on it to Ben, which is how I have a nice collection, because he sold them cheap to me when I couldn't afford very much. I got a whole lot of these things from him only because he was stuck with him because Ben didn't buy him. <laughs> okay. And then, like 10 years later, I get approached. You can read about this in Newsweek. If you feed in work chapter in Newsweek, you'll see the one time I got national Newsweek publicity when a West Coast company that was doing phylogenic research was looking for a sample of old cannabis and they that. contacted me because I uh, uh, bought uh, something with P 
pills in it at an auction. And I said, hey, well, you know, is it hey, possible that we can test that stuff that you that bought? And I said, you just hit the mother load. I got at least 150 jars with stuff contents in it. That was enough to get them to fly from Oregon to come take samples. And they were able to find traces of cannabis in 17% of the samples that they took, which is not not bad considering these samples are 100 years old. Right, right. Yeah. So um, now I run into you quite frequently when we're doing speaking engagements. You and I got to hang out quite a bit in Thailand just a month and a half ago. So well, I don't know um, how you've done it, Paul, but you've made yourself the Jack Herrera of South and Central America. And I mean, how many times have you traveled south in the last five years? I mean, and these guys are all paying to get Paul Stanford to show up and give a speech on stage. It's a good scam you got going, Paul. It's, they treat us really well down there. I mean, I've been I've been taking advantage of it a little bit myself, um, but they, you know, we get treated like kings. This is the same in Thailand. You, you know, the, the hospitality could not be better, it, and and uh, people were just so kind. And it, I'm I'm loving to travel, but I mean, you've been nonstop. I there's there's times where you've been taking four or five trips in a row or showing up at five different events in five weeks. And, and I watch your schedule because I see your Facebook and see you wishing happy birthday to everybody every morning. <laughs> I, I've slowed down on that the past couple of months. I just, oh, do I recognize this person? You know, there's so many of them. It's hard to keep, you know, I, uh, when I go through the Facebook birthday thing too, I get to see people I don't know who passed away and then I can let I have a few hundred people who are trying to get into that 5,000 you know how that works but you know <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know how I got into I think our friend Mike Bafari and and Cheery it started with them for me the first international one I went to was in Spain Expo Grow where the guy from uh from Spain in uh Granada he uh they, they paid me to go to that first one, and it's led to a whole bunch. One leads to another, leads to another, what I could it's say. true. If I had more time, I could do more. And and I love the travel. I, even in this gruesome age of travel. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, we're making difference. We're making an impact on South America. This place is coming along fast. That's true. It's been a great ability to to meet kindred spirits and to, to talk about him and, and show uh, all its different aspects. And so, you know, I often talk about its history just to show how far back this goes to pre way before any civilization we know today was around. People were- I mean, it's important. People are naive people, the people not turned on which is 60% of us, uh, uh, they're scared of it. They, they, they have 70, you know, the last 85 years of conditioning. This is the devil's weed. This is going to shrink your brain, whatever it is. They're scared of it. And the way to disarm them is to show them, wait a minute, this was mainstream and accepted, and this is really just government bullshit that you're filled up with. And, and that's why... Uh, teaching the history and showing these old products is so important. It's kind of what we're dedicated to doing. So I know you went to, you've toured several places. You were in your local library with uh, a show. Uh, you've been going to museum conferences too, to kind of learn the ropes, I guess. Yeah, it's it's a different profession. It's something I've not experience well it's about as difficult as 30 years ago when i tried to get into the fashion industry with no clue about fashion in my appalachian existence and uh, you know well, that it's, was it's, what's that that was with the ohio hippery oh yeah no we were we were way ahead of the pack i had you know basically 
sold the idea of creating a leading hemp business as a way to spark up the hemp revolution. I, was, I wanted to, in my words at the time, create a wave and ride it. And I was able to ride it for a long time. You know, I feel better. I feel worse about my uh, an eventual failure as a business is Ohio Hempery. If I had seen any one of the 10,000 hemp businesses that started after me do really well, right? I can't identify the winner 20 some years later. So I think my decision to not raise money from other people and just understand that um, it wasn't going to work. I had a friend at the time who ran a mail order company, and she basically explained over and over again to me and that, you know, you're putting, this is the old days, this is before the internet understand. So, yeah, yeah, but that you basically put out catalogs, and if you don't get a 3% return on the catalog, then you're in trouble and you gotta you gotta do something else. And basically we basically figured out that people were buying hemp products who did really well to reach new people. People bought their hemp product, but then it was like, oh well I've saved the world, I can go spend my money on something else. And and we weren't putting out putting out sustainable, long-term, investable, last-your-lifetime products. And, and it, you know, it, it didn't work that well, although people continue to bring in their old hemp purchases 20 years later. Uh, so somebody just brought me a 25-year-old shirt in perfect condition. I've got a stack of hemp notepads right here. I Every patient that comes to my clinic, I offer, and most of them take me up on it, I give them a couple of hip notepads still yeah. from that very first shipment of lightweight paper that, that yeah, really- Yeah, send me a case. I'll put them in the store. <laughs> it's an antique already, you know, it's imported yeah. back in 1990. You know, you've been a longtime advocate and working with the Rainbow family. Do you want to talk about how you started with that and about the, the rainbow gatherings. Is that something you'd like to discuss? Oh, sure. I I mean, it's kind of my spiritual center. It's really, you know, the most important part of my year. Every first week in July, we gather somewhere else. Uh, I've done it since 1980 consistently. Uh, the gatherings have evolved or devolved considerably since my youth, and but explain so have they. Was that the rainbow, explain to our audience what the Rainbow Family is? They have these annual gatherings and regional gatherings of like-minded hippies, basically. You know, we're described as the Woodstock family uh, gathering that. Uh, it's really started more on the West Coast, uh, but of the Woodstock generation and right after Woodstock. And these gatherings started, the first one in Colorado had 50,000 people. Uh, we are a totally free and non-commercial event. If you try to sell something inside the gathering, people are just going to laugh at you and nobody's got any money anyway. Uh, we provide for this by people bringing what they need and bringing a lot extra for everybody else. And it's, uh, you know, it acts like Woodstock did, you know, that you're trying to take care of each other. And I used to love the Rainbow Gathering because it was quite a source of real gathering. We had seminars all day long, a big seminar board, and you could have your choice of 10 or 15 different things to go in a different spot in the woods and learn. Uh, we had all kinds of political action uh, events and, you know, people meeting and trying to recruit people into their ways of thought. There's, 
I, I miss that. There's a lot less of that now. Uh, um, I used to, but anyhow, my, my, my role has always been to deal with the onslaught of federal interference we have for these gatherings. I, I liken it to the locusts, uh, you know, locusts come every 17 years so they don't raise predators, but the rainbow gathering trying to do this on national forest land on an annual basis raised a gang of federal predators a full time office in the office of the Forest Service law enforcement where they do nothing but try to repress the existence of the rainbow gathering and they come out there and use us for federal training purposes. They bring in their rookie, but you know, like their better rookie LEOs, law enforcement officers, and they use the rainbow gathering for teaching them crowd control, car searching, use of tasers, and all these things out in the woods using us as guinea pigs. And it's a total unbelievable violation. You know, this year, this, this is relevant. And we've had all kinds of things happen around this in pot because, you know, for years, they do these roadblocks on the cars coming in. And they keep finding people with half a gram, you know, two grams, six tenths of a gram, little tiny sacramental quantities, little pipes. This half the court cases that they call out of these rainbow gatherings have to do with harassment about people with pipes. And and in the, to the most tiny quantities of cannabis you can find. Until this year, I used to say they'd never have found a mother load. You know, they found $25,000 in cash on somebody's car once searching it really well, but they've never found the mother load that they've been looking for. This year, I understand they found a couple, you know, naive people who thought they could come and deal drugs at the Rainbow Gathering, you know, you know and I'm not helping them. But I've been helping, so as part of this, FEMA sponsored assault of civil rights that, that the feds pull on us at the rainbow gatherings. Um, oh, yeah, where was it going? You got all these FEMA guys. They've, they've used us to train how they're going to deal with crowds, you know, to determine who's been exposed to the virus or not exposed to the virus, who's an insurrectionist and not. You know, so they're trying to come up with ways of making summary carts. How are you going to deal with a whole bunch of people out in the woods and put them through some kind of Nazi-style judicial system and, and you know, basically have a summary court, a kangaroo court with no way to appeal it out there in the woods. you got the marshals, you know, hurting you one way or the other. And this is this, you know, worst case scenario of human existence is being modeled by the government on innocent attendees of this peace and love festival. Yeah, so, it's amazing. The whole yeah. point is to be peaceful and and love one another and create peace. And somehow the federal government has a task force to go after you. It's just uh, or Orwellian, to say the least. So they don't get the message very well. This year, they stopped a couple hundred cars coming into the gathering and found pot in a couple few dozen of them. And they charged them with the ticket. This is Colorado. You could go to Hayden, the closest town. They had two dispensaries. The steamboat had probably five of them. You know, this the, federal the federal airport and this gathering, there are probably 30 visible dispensaries. So you could buy that and then drive down the road toward this gathering and all of a sudden you're committing a federal crime. And so, Great. yeah, I was, I was out there at the Kangaroo Court. They do these things in parking lots. They've got, they've, they're, they're trying to find the most inexpensive way to do it. They used to, in the early days, FEMA would actually pay a volunteer fire department, say, hey, we'll fence your uh, fire department if you uh, will let us do this for a few days. Or, they, you know, they did deals to 
of being able to like you know make these FEMA temporary jails that they've basically set up all across the country now for times of insurrection. And, well, they're waiting for us. We're, yeah. we're almost out of time. You also have been a big uh, organizer at the Seattle Hemp Fest. In fact, I hope to see that rise from the ashes. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I think the very last event that, that we had there was the, the panel of old timers. And you and I were on that panel with uh, <laughs> Portland's own Lee Berger and uh, Carolyn Garcia, most notably. And uh, that's right. I hope yeah. that's not the last uh, the last event that ever happens at the Seattle Hemp Fest. Do you think it will rise from the ashes? Um, I don't know, Paul. I'm just not seeing any real smoke. You yeah, know? I'm not. I'm I'm kind of feeling like the people who put this on have realized that it just got so big. Yeah. That, and and that everybody had their hands out. You know, every year the city would hit them up for more of this and more of that, and the parks would hit them up for more of this and more of that, and you got to upgrade this and upgrade that. It got really expensive. And then the land that we used to, for the production area, they built Expedia National Headquarters on. And even though they aren't using it, we could park there, they're not letting anybody use it. So... I mean, I I mourn the loss of Hemp Fest. It was the best we ever did for a festival. It changed the world. We got cannabis legal in Washington through Hemp Fest, working together in a massive team. We changed the debate. We made it, you know, medical, and then we made it recreational, and now we're making it economical. I know you know I was one of the biggest supporters in terms of being a Presenting sponsor there. Yeah, absolutely. You put significant sponsorship in that event. I put my time. That's the best I could do. I was thank you, Paul. Well, There's thank a lot you. more we can cover, but we're we're about done with our show now. It, last cannabismuseum.com. Right? Yes, sir. Yes. What do you want to say in closing? Well, I hope that you can help us get this national impact for a museum that we're trying to have. This is at trying to be a national museum. We're gonna build it one room at a time. The Cannabis Museum, this is what I didn't finish saying, it's got many different rooms, talking about the prohibition of cannabis, the heroes that brought it back, the poetry around cannabis and the literature around cannabis, and cannabis around the world and the history of smoking. There's all these different shows that we tend to organized over the next few years, one at a time here. So have patience with us. Someday, somebody will build a nice big building and we'll be able to occupy it as the Canvas Museum. I got the stuff, someone else can buy the building. It's well, I and look forward to seeing it. And uh, glad to finally get you on the show. I don't know how many times I asked you, but uh, uh, glad to finally have you on here. You're right on. I'll talk to you later. Don Wirt Chapter with CannabisMuseum.com and the Ohio Hempery Seattle Hemp Fest Rainbow Family. Thank you, Don. Restore hemp. Yes, sir.